All right, so listen, Blue and Damage aren't here today, and I'm riding solo, but uh, of course, if I'm going to try to become an Emmy-nominated talk show host, I got to have a conversation with another Emmy-nominated talk show host. <laughs> What's up, Tamar? What's up, Tom? <laughs> yeah, I feel like we've been trying to do this forever. I either got to pull up on you on the Bigo streets or the clubhouse streets because, you know, you're, you're on social now a little bit more than you were before. But I'm glad we've been trying to do this for a minute. I'm glad we're able to get together. I know. I know. Finally, right? Listen, I posted today. I said, you know, I'm talking to Tamar and I just recently did a whole public thing where I said I'm getting off of Viacom. I left Viacom. I left reality TV. Uh, you and I have been having a lot of conversations about your experience with reality TV. And so when I posted today that I was going to be talking to you, everybody was asking me to ask you to come back to reality TV, but you told me you're not going to do that. Never. I'm never, ever, ever, never, never, ever, ever doing another reality show about my life. Ever. But why, though, you're so entertaining and the public has invested themselves in your life. We want to know everything you're doing when you're going to the bathroom, how you're raising your kid, who you're dating. Absolutely. All that. Oh, absolutely not. I just feel like, you know, I've invited people into my life for 10 years, right? And once you start like being in the reality world, it's really, really hard to um, stop people from being invested in your personal business, right? And all of that does for a person like me who's been on for so long is, you know, ruin relationships and, <laughs> you know, and also, you know, ruin who you really truly are because you're never allowed to be that person because of, you know, whatever the network that you're on has decided the character that you must play. <laughs> so for me, um, it's best to um, show you guys who I really truly am. And that is only through a talk show or a game show or hosting something so you can really see my real true personality because it's nothing like, you know, what you have been seeing for the past 10 years. But that's interesting that you say that because I was thinking about this interview for the last, I don't know, however many months we've been trying to do this. <laughs> and I was thinking like, who is the real Tamar, right? Because I remember when the when your reality show with your family first came out, of course I knew Tony Braxton because my gay ass has been singing Unbreak My Heart since the 90s. Yeah. Um, and, and then we were introduced to you and you quickly became the star of the show. Yeah. Um, wh who were you then and are you the same person now? No, I wasn't. That was 10 years ago. So I've evolved, you know, and when the show first started, I was not problematic. I was not an angry black woman. I didn't have issues with other women and all of the tacky um, black female stigmas that that particular network has an issue um, with showing, you know what I'm saying? That's what they want to show is, you know, ignorant black women. And, you know, I think that show turned into that when it wasn't supposed to be that. You know what I'm saying? Like you didn't so, see the side of being educated. You didn't see the side of us, you know, being entrepreneurs. You didn't see that. No one knew that I created Braxton Family Values until after everything had blown up. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it wasn't a priority um, for, you know, us to be what the show was created to be. And that was, you know, to be five African-American women who just happens to be sisters on all walks of life, but trying to figure out how to get to their dreams and hopes and aspirations. And you saw a little bit of that, you know, during the first and second season. But after that, it turned into basically a shit show. So one of the things they told me early on about Love and Hip Hop, Love and Hip Hop was is if you want a relationship to work, don't bring it in reality TV. Is that true for your experience it's at WeTV? Absolutely true. And it's not even just that. I'm not going to say that per se for them because we're not going to go into a lawsuit. I don't feel like that. Um, <laughs> and it's definitely some things that I, you know, can't talk about legally, you know, and saying their name, I'm not going to do that. So, um, I don't know if answering that question is putting me in that situation, but, um, yeah, I'm not going to. Yeah, no. Well, the reason why I asked that is because you were one of the first people to be vocal about how things were over at that network. Uh, and then since then, we've had Dame Dash come out and speak out about them. We've had other people on the network, uh, reality stars, come out and say that uh, the depiction of black people uh, was negative. And so I, I, I'm wondering, is it a pandemic over there at that network or is it just uh, everybody's trying to get their contracts and coming up with the same story? Doesn't that sound crazy? That <laughs> Because you remember, I don't know if you remember, at first, when I first started speaking out about it, um, no one believed me. And, you know, 
looking back at it, how could they? Because, you know, the depiction of me was problematic, right? So for me to come out and say that these things were actually really going on and this was my experience, you know, no one wanted to believe it. And I don't even think it's really just that particular network. Can we actually sit here and uh, name a positive black reality television show? What's the name of it? Well, I've, I've been very vocal. This, I've been very vocal about the fact that I feel like these networks that are ran by a bunch of white people create um, uh, conversations and experiences for the culture that are really negative and continues to perpetuate this vision of what black people look like and how we interact. And uh, I've said that, but I don't think anybody's listening to me either. No, but but here's the thing. It's not even really about the execs so much. It's It's the fact that we as a people participate in it, you know? We still sign up to do it, you know, because everybody wants a shot, <laughs> you know, everybody wants to be famous, everybody wants to, you know, have a, you know, a platform where they can make money and I'm not knocking them, but um, we, do we, we do have a responsibility to keep that narrative going. And I just feel like we will sign up to be on TV at any cost, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then, you know, as a people, we watch it. So when, you know, a network sees uh, a show that is generating numbers, which is generating income, lots of it, um, the people who show up are gaslit and tricked <laughs> into thinking they are going to have this life that they never end up having, you know? So it um, we have to stop participating and that's the bottom line. But but the, uh, there's another side of that coin, right? There's also the doors that are provided for people of color to walk into. And if each of those doors, like in my case, Love & Hip Hop was the only door that opened for me at the time. Yeah. Um, and I thought I thought I had enough self-control to navigate through those ratchet waters. I just didn't. I yeah. figured it out and I came out scratched up, but not, you know, not not destroyed. Don't you think, though, that, you know, networks like a Fox Soul that has created you know, content uh, with people of color that isn't combat television. Don't you think that that it can exist, though, that we can open more doors no, or create more no, doors I for people of color? No, I absolutely don't, because that's not reality television. Mm. <laughs> and I'm being specific. You know, I'm not talking about black shows. No, there's been amazing black shows. There, there's been a different world. There's been 227. There's been your show. There's been the Claudia show. There's been the show with Mike and Donnie. They're good shows have been on television where, you know, black people have been able to be educated and fun and innovative and inspiring, um, but not on reality TV. And But you'll, you'll never you'll never see a black keeping up with the Kardashians because showing families in a positive light that has some drama sprinkled in it will never be the thing. Well, it sure happened to the Braxton's. You know, we're not criminals. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We don't have 13,000 baby daddies running around. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> somehow it turned into the combative black family when, you know, we were nothing like that. So there you have it. Mm. All right. So when did so when did you start seeing the evolution change? Was it around season three? It was around or was it or was it happening during season one and two, meaning you were being groomed for and didn't even know? I didn't know. That's what I'm saying. That's so funny that you said that. Um, so I think like season, like towards the end of season two, because season one um, had gotten all of this attention and I definitely wasn't used to it, attention, but I was used to the lifestyle because of my ex-husband at the time, right? And um, instead of embracing that and making it, um, a, a family thing. Um, it was made an individual thing. And it was something that started to brew. Oh, Tamar's getting a big head or Tamar's acting funny. Tamar's starting to argue with this sister. Then it's that sister. Then it's that sister. And, um, but you know, why were they why were they labeling you the troublemaker? Was it because you were the star of the show or in the more livelier one? Or why, why were you uh, chosen as the problematic person? Well, let's just be honest and, and look at the track record of each black reality <laughs> television show. You know, it's the it's the most popular one who is ostracized and who is talked about and who is attacked because 
you're going to get a reaction. <laughs> like somebody like me and you, Jason, like we're not ones to hold our tongue. You know what I mean? Right. I, right. I, I'm going to tell your audience something. I can I cannot count on my hands how many times I've called Jason and talked his ass off the ledge. <laughs> like, don't say that. Don't do Listen, that. Listen, you know? Tamar is Tamar is literally the um, Hollywood Unlock Godmother. I will get a text and be like, hold on, uh, uh, everything okay? I'm like, Tamar, not today. I'm gonna have to call you tomorrow. You, you are, but see, that's the thing. Privately, you are the peacemaker. You're thoughtful. You're caring. You do check in on people, and then. TV, I mean, I, I think you're great television because you're just so animated, but I never I never thought of you as like the angry black woman. I did it. Well, because I think you had an understanding of who I was. And I think, you know, at first, um, doing uh, The Real and The Braxtons, it was kind of like leveled out a little bit because then you, you got to see my real personality. Like, that's who I really, truly am. You know what I mean? Um, funny opinionated, educated, um, creative, a producer. Um, is that is, is that why Lonnie Love was threatened by you? Because she, I don't think she liked you. I mean, she, you know, if you ever run into the bully on the schoolyard, because I saw the Breakfast Club interview where all the girls were kind of sitting around her, like Latavia, Latoya, and Kelly. But baby, she she wanted to be Beyonce that day, and she had a lot to say about you. It just was she jealous because you were the more popular woman on the show. I mean, everybody loved you. I heard Michelle Obama even loved you more than all the other girls. That's what the streets told me. Well, you know, Michelle and I hit it off <laughs> very well when we first met, and I think she's a phenomenal woman. And it was surprising to me because that was the first time I've ever been to the White House. And she knew every member of my family. She even asked about my baby and where he was and how my mom was. And, you know, that is the kind of response, you know, that I always wanted the Braxtons to have on our community because um, it was created for that fact. Because Black people, I don't know a black Kardashian, <laughs> but you know, you sure do know an auntie like my mom or a cousin wait, like the, wait, her. the Kardashian, the Kardashians aren't black. <laughs> you know, I'm saved now, but last I checked, they were Armenian, correct? No, because Kim has had those very braids, Tamar. That's why I thought maybe you pulled up because I thought they said the internet says she created box braids. Maybe I missed, I don't know. I don't know. But Braids are universal. So wait, so, okay, you're really good at deflecting. So going back to why Lonnie doesn't like you, is that because, I mean, because I don't know, did Michelle ask about her family when you guys were at the White House? Well, um, she asked about all of us. <laughs> you need the Lord, you too. I don't even, listen, I don't even want to talk negatively about any of those ladies, you know? Since then, Adrian and I have had amazing conversations and I love her to death and Jeannie, I'm so happy for her and Tamara, I miss her so much. And I just really honestly don't know where things went wrong between, you know, Lonnie and myself, because I looked at all of those girls as my sisters. And so what I don't want to do now is, you know, perpetuate something between she and I, again, that would um, demonstrate us being negative towards each other in public. I just think that, you know, we have to take responsibility for the things that we do and participate in. And I'm just not going to participate in arguing with another black person publicly ever again, because it's not necessary. It starts with us. The reason I asked the question, and I totally agree with that. Yes, that's me being messy, because that's what I do. But the reason why I asked the question is because I've heard a lot of people talking for you and why y'all fell out, but I don't know that I've ever heard you say why y'all fell out. And is that intentional or did I miss it? Or are you just, it's, it's, it's above you and you're over it. Which is it? It's E all of the above, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, listen, time heals all wounds. And, you know, when something happens to you, you have to look within yourself and find out what part did you play in it. And I am not going to sit here and say that um, every single instance with me and somebody else, I was an innocent person because I'm sure I've done something to offend them or said something. I might not know what that is, um, but 
I'm sure that I played a part in it. And just to any of those girls, I just want to just say publicly, um, I don't, I love you. You know, I wish you well. I'm proud of you. It's not easy out here. And that's it. You know, I, I don't even care about what the issues were. Um, it's just, not something that I think about anymore because you know I'm not even on that path anymore. And I don't even want to, you know, re revisit anything that was combative like that in my life because it doesn't serve me any purpose. Okay. So the last question I'll ask since you want to move on is um, the show has clearly been failing without you. They've gone through multiple uh, rotating seats. They had Amanda Seals on there who clearly was too black for that show. Uh, and then they tried to come back with a segment that was almost identical to her brand. That was interesting. Uh, do you miss the show at all? And do you wish you were there? Would you ever go back? I definitely would never go back. But um, I do miss the talk show forum. You know, I definitely fell in love with it. I definitely um, want to go back to that. Um, but I just think that at the time, I didn't understand. I didn't understand it, but I think that my time there was up, you know, and I feel like I was being set up for what is happening in my life now, which is a total transformation and a different outlook on life and a different, you know, view of myself. Because I feel like if, if I would have stayed there, then I wouldn't have had the growth that I've had, the individual growth that I have now that was definitely necessary. Mm. Now, where did you get that? Because sometimes you have to be out of it for a minute to look back. Did you, is it more hindsight or was it something that you came to realize and then left? Um, well, I never left the show. <laughs> You're so funny. You get what you need, okay? <laughs> what? what? You know, I was, you know, I mean, listen, allegedly I've heard a lot of things, you know what I mean? And the most recent thing that I've heard sounds about right to me, you know what I mean? Um, but it is what it is. And my situation um, at that other network was what it was and they did what they did and that's it. <laughs> You know, but you're you're better than me. And that's why I say it has to come growth. I know you're under construction. We're going to talk about that. But for me, like, I feel like when I've earned something, like I've earned it. Nobody's given me anything. I, yeah, I earned Love and Hip Hop. I earned Wild and Out. I've earned this show. I've earned it all. Uh, I, I don't, if somebody tried to take something from me, I'm burning everything down. But that's just me. Is that childish? Is that, what is that? Is that me just not, is that, what am I missing? Maturity? Uh what is it? Because I, if I, if I bring, if I, if I build some shit that don't work for me, it, it gotta all burn the fuck down. That's just, but that's me. Well, I, I don't feel like I didn't think that way at some point. Um, but I've always moved with integrity. You know what I mean? And that's why I haven't completely burned down the barn. <laughs> mm. Um, and I also feel like sometimes we we think we're God and we think that we have to do his job. Like he needs our help and he doesn't, you know, he always, he's always going to take care of his people. And I believe that I am, you know, a child of God. And I feel like he's, he's got my back and he holds my future and my hand and doesn't anyone else. And so, um, I don't know, Jason, I'm not going to lie and say, you know, I wasn't angry and hurt and devastated at that time because Definitely I was, it was, it was my baby. You know what I'm saying? It was something that, you know, Vince and I and Telepictures and Sally Ann created together. And it was important to all of us and we loved it. Um, but you know, sometimes things. Wait, wait, Sally Ann, Telepictures, what you guys created the real? Together. Yes, we did. Wait, Lonnie didn't create the real? Oh, wait a minute. No, see, I was about to let you get out of here with that, with these questions, but I'm, I'm good. You could just refuse to answer, but I'm asked. Wait a minute. So you mean to tell me Lonnie did not create the real because the way she talks about the show, it's her show. Did I miss some? Tamar, you playing that? You playing? And Sally Ann was the woman who got you out. No, Sally Ann Salcino, absolutely not. Oh no. Okay, so Sally Ann is she's an ally. She's good. Oh, I love her. I love okay, her. Okay, because I've I've Roger, heard good things. She's amazing. She's one of the and I'll tell everybody this. She's one of the most 
amazing Hollywood producers, period. She does amazing I was about to say, television. I was about to say, because I'm getting ready to meet with her. So I was about to make She's my own little amazing. note. I love her so much. She's so amazing. And I'm telling you, if you're going to meet with her, you have to definitely work with her. You, you won't meet anybody any better than that. And I'm well, being- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell her you and I should do a talk show together because I think we can run all these other girls out the business. But wait, you didn't act, you didn't say all that about how amazing Lonnie was. So I'm just going to let it go. So Lonnie tried to steal your show that you created with Vince. Got it. Okay. <laughs> she, she did it and I didn't say that. <laughs> but let's move on, you know? <laughs> Let's. Okay. (laughs) So one thing I know about you for sure is you are a really loving, caring mother and you love your son uh, tremendously. Um, When you think about you as a mom, what, what comes to mind? Balance and how I'm always looking for balance because, you know, I'm a hustler too. (laughs) And so like, you know, I'm, I'm working all the time and, you know, always trying to make sure my pillar with my child is always met is so hard for me, you know, because he's growing up and the things he used to like back then, he don't like now. So um, yeah, that's hard for me. So it's balanced. And I always want to make sure he's happy. I'm always asking him, are you happy? And that could be counseling and that could be, you know, him being in counseling, our counseling together. I just want to make sure that our lines of communication are always open. So when I think about your your family and motherhood, I think about Miss Evelyn, who, ru- <laughs> who who seems to rule with the iron fist. Like I don't know if, if Miss Evelyn cocktails, but I want to get cocktail with Miss Evelyn one good time. Um, does she? Are you? When you look at her parenting and how she parented all of these girls, do you parent the same way, or 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 are you different? How do you find it lining up? You know, my mom is a phenomenal mother, and. She, she, as a matter of fact, she's always been my dad too. They were great parents. And, you know, I couldn't imagine raising six kids. You know what I mean? Like it's a lot. And I don't know. Um, I don't think we parent the same, you know, I mean, I'm having a hard time with discipline and I've given birth to myself. So, (laughs) um, you know, I just really, do the best that I can. And I ask her for a lot of advice, a lot of advice. I only have one and it's a lot. So yeah, no, I don't parent like her at all. She had lots of discipline and we were well and intact and mine is all over the place, but he's a loving boy. Do you want more kids? I absolutely do, but I want a husband first and you know how that worked out. So here I am. (laughs) Well, 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 I mean, you know, I know how to transition. Do you remember this relationship? Let me show you a picture really quick. Oh Lord, here we go. So now, you know, you look amazing in this photo. Um, If I could just cut you out of it, it would give me everything that I need. All right. So you were with David um, and I've been very vocal to you that I and these are my opinions. I was not a fan of David. I had saw the advanced tape of the show that you guys did on WeTV uh, and thought in the first two, three episodes, it summed everything up that I needed to know about him. Controlling, jealous. Uh, he wanted to be you. Uh, he wanted the recognition. Um, and one thing in particular that I could have snatched him through the fucking TV was when your ex-husband brought your son home to your house and wanted to tuck him in. And the man said, to you, don't be bringing no nigga in my house. Now, Tamar, how did you even let yourself get wrapped up in that with him? <laughs> you know why I can't stand you. <laughs> but this is what I will say. And this is what I've always said. You know, I'm a real honest person. And I would be less than a real woman to sit here and say all of those things about him were true. It's not true and it's not fair. And I've said that, you know, and that's what I mean about the depiction of reality television and black people. So why is it when when a man cares for his woman, concerned about his woman, asks about people that are in her life, protects his woman, why is why is he called controlling? Why can't he be looking out for his woman. I don't, I don't really understand that. You know, we all say we want a strong black man. We want somebody to protect us and somebody to love us. And when they do that, we call, we openly call them controlling. 
So what what is it that we want here? You know what I mean? I didn't have a bad time. <laughs> he wasn't well, was... mean or nasty or rude to me. He was amazing to my child. You know, we we had um, a pretty decent relationship. <laughs> and the minute it came on TV is when things started going, you know, downhill. And I can completely understand his point of view when it comes to television because I'm not even going to lie. My life changed <laughs> negatively. My relationship started to uh, deplete and deflate um, when, you know, I, I started, you know, being on reality television in a negative light. You know, it, it wasn't helpful to my real life. It just wasn't. Mm. But OK, so if I date somebody who I the public doesn't know, if I date somebody that the public doesn't know, they don't have what I have, they live a different lifestyle, or maybe they even have similar, but it's very different. Um, and then we do reality TV. The one thing that I think people have to own is what they show up and put out, right? Like I threw a drink on Love & Hip Hop. I have still, I still get that from time to time. I own it. I've apologized. I've stood in my truth. And the things that we saw on the show, we saw, right? So are you saying then what we saw what was... What we saw on the show was definitely not, not accurate. And I'm just going to be a thousand. I remember when I saw the show for the first time, um, it was ridiculous. And I was furious. Like, I'm like, what? what is this? This is not what we discussed. It's almost like, you ever seen that movie Bowfinger? No. Okay, so the movie Bowfinger had Eddie Murphy in it and Steve Martin in it, and it was um, Steve Martin directing this film. And they they got all of these stars in the movie, right? But the the stars didn't know that they were shooting a movie. So <laughs> so I just feel like it's a Bowfinger situation. I'm shooting one show, and I have no idea it's a whole nother show that's being shot. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? So things would be asked and people would pop up over to my home and ask me questions out the blue that had nothing to do with what I did that day. But I love, but I love the show. I told you when I, I watched the show. It. I hated it. And, you know, I find it to be very disrespectful, disregarding. And, you know, when you're in a situation, I'm getting upset about it because it's like this. That show was supposed to be another opportunity to show a black woman when she's not, I'm not going to say down, but not having gotten life all the way figured out how she picked herself back up again, how she renavigated her life being a single mom, how she figured out the dating world after being divorced and um, what she was going to do with her career. And then her successes, buying her first home by herself, her, celebrating her wins with her friends, having amazing people around you and just, you know, creating the life that you actually wanted to have for yourself that you actually built. And that is what my, my, but you, but you, you don't think, you don't think you got, you don't, you don't think you got any of that in that show. No, I do not. No, I don't. That show was definitely supposed to be about uh, me putting together my one woman show and putting it on the road. And it was all a lie. So let me go back and ask you this. So the scene where you guys were sitting at the table, I don't know if you were in a restaurant or whatever, and he was explaining to you about him is events coming to your house. Did you do you feel like that was just a moment taken out of context or do you completely. feel like that was real? Come you know? Absolutely. You know, the reason why Vince wasn't a part of the show is because people wasn't going to be able to help themselves in creating an issue between my ex and my ex-husband. Do you understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? We didn't yeah. have those kind of problems. You know what I mean? We, we They didn't argue and fight and um, have issues with one another. I mean, David was, a, I can't say he was a man's man because I felt like he, he really is a real man, but I'm going to say in my life at the time. So when I refer to past tense, that's what I mean. I don't mean it in a disrespectful way. But what I'm saying is David was a real man's man. You know what I mean? And, you know, just like any other man, they don't want another man walking through their house. And it doesn't matter how many children they got together. That's just who he is as an individual. Now, now let's flip the script, okay? Now, had it been David and David's baby mama came over to the house, walked on through the house, went to my son's, went to their son's room and took my son in, gave him a bath. I would have an issue with that. Like, why is you but, making up all the ass like that? But, it, but in, all, in all fairness, 
Tamar, when you went through that really challenging situation, which I thought you you breathed power into a conversation, I think that's important for everybody uh, around uh, suicide. And I want to talk. I want to touch on that a little bit. Right, literally, right after that situation, I feel like David didn't even show you the same amount of respect that you're showing him today when he was seen with some woman that he allegedly was hooking up with, like right after you were out the hospital. I mean, and this was a woman who I guess was either your friend or his friend or somewhere close to the situation. To me, it was messy. It was disrespectful. Um, and it was sure. literally less respect than you're giving him today. So I'm just trying to like hear you give him life and be nice. But also thinking about when I saw those pictures of them on the boat, when you had literally just either got out the hospital or were still in it. So is that the same person you're describing today? It is, but that's not my job. It's not my job to um, be rude and hateful and nasty because it didn't work out and drag him and hang him out to dry. I think what's happening, you know, in, in the opinions of everyone, you know, is what's happening because that's what someone put out there. You know what I mean? But my personal experience with him, with him wasn't horrible, no matter what happened, or what came out of what was really going on while we were in a relationship, that was not my personal um, relationship with him. So I can only speak about um, what happened in our relationship and things were great. And that's all I'm gonna speak about. Then I have to ask you about this right here because um, you know the way you look out for me uh, in making sure that I don't drive or jump all the way off of ledges I just want to make sure that I'm doing my job and asking you the questions that I never ask you privately because I do respect your privacy as a friend and I do consider you a friend. So there was this picture right here that I want to ask you about. This photo was a bruise that I believe he put on your arm. Now I know I'm probably violating the friend code by talking about something publicly that I haven't asked permission for, but I want to make sure that because there are so women, so many women that do look at you as a champion for many things. You overcome, uh, you know, obstacles. You stand in your truth. You say it like you mean it. You show up with grace. You're a great mother. You're a great sister. Um, and you're a strong Black woman. Uh, I, I want to make sure that when we stand with the hashtag protect Black women, that protecting Black men, although a priority, isn't in a way of sliding who you are to other women. So uh, that bruise, he grabbed you in the, on your arm, correct? Okay, so it's a lot of variables as to why I can't give you a direct answer, okay? Um, number one is the legal aspect. And um, listen, I'm just going to be a thousand with you, and I've never lied to you about anything, big or small, right? Um, that day in the car was a horrible day, and um, it was a lot of emotions. It was a lot happening, you know? Um, and I'm not making excuses for him, but I'm talking about um, the experience that we both had with suicide, right? And how hard that was for both of us and how difficult in that moment it was for the both of us to figure out what had just transpired in our relationship and our friendship and our family. And um, it, it, was, it was very, very hard. It was probably the worst argument I've ever been in in my life. And I'm pretty sure that I can speak for him in that aspect. But um, I'm going to tell you that um, David and I was not in an emotionally nor um, physically abusive relationship. Um, but... I am going to say that that was the worst argument we've ever had in our lives. And so the legal aspect is why you can't really get into the details of it. But do you think that, did you see that that type of situation would escalate to the point to where you would end up with a bruise on your arm? Do you think, I mean, like, do you think I'm ridiculous or like dumb? <laughs> do you think I'm gonna answer that? <laughs> But you're good. <laughs> um, okay. Listen, listen, listen. Um, 
I'm just going to be honest. The biggest bruise that I got from that car ride, I still have. And I still have it because it's not exterior, you know, and, I, and I'm just going to be comfortable and say the only bruise, you know, is the one that lives within. It was a hard time. And I really, I really wish that I had the tools to have a different conversation with him, you know, because at the end of the day, um, we were really good friends. And, you know, what we experienced was something that was magical. And that's not the case anymore. And I'm not saying that's what I want it to be. You know, things happen for a reason. A lot of things has been said. A lot of things have been done. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I wish him the best in any endeavors that he has. So it. so I want to go back to this, the suicide attempt, because since that happened, I'd never had anybody that I know commit suicide. And I did have a friend commit suicide right after that. Um, and it was somebody who we didn't see it coming. Uh, he had two small babies and uh, he just, just ran and jumped in front of a truck Jesus. and died. Um, when I heard this come out about you and I heard the 911 call, many things ran through my head. One, the first thing I thought about was Logan. Um, how hard was the decision to try to commit suicide knowing Logan would still be here. Here you go. Well, um, it was, that decision was made because of, you know, my son, you know, I, I didn't want to be the person in his life who was negative. I didn't want to be the person in his life he had to be embarrassed by, you know, and um, I'm not going to say that the people in my life didn't see it coming. They should have expected that. I said, this is how I felt. If I continued doing this, you know, show, if I continued, you know, down this path, this is how I, I was feeling. I was in counseling. <laughs> I was very vocal about how I felt. You know, I, I felt useless. I felt I didn't own myself. I, I felt um, like a puppet. I felt caged. And I felt like I was sinking. And um, I I wrote my bosses and the powers that be and told everybody in the cast, this, this is how I was feeling. And it was, they they didn't have any regard. They didn't care. You did know? they ignore you? Did they yeah, ignore absolutely. you? Absolutely, they did. They wrote back finally um, two days before it happened and said I was being dramatic. That was their response? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That was being dramatic and basically uh, report to work or <laughs> we're going to send you a breach letter. You're not going to be able to work anyway. And I got the breach letter the day before. So. Really? Yeah. Wait, so, um, so, uh, okay, so when it happened... Your, I'm going to skip past the phone call and go to your family spoke out. One of your sisters or a couple of your sisters spoke out. David was speaking out. I mean, I felt like everybody but Tamar was talking when it was Tamar who was given the cry for help. And that really hit me. Like, I didn't understand why so many people were talking on your behalf. When you came out of it and saw everybody talking on your behalf, were you angry? Were you, did you, did, were you happy that people finally cared? How did you feel? Um, I was um, confused. Mm. I was confused. I was confused. And, you know, once again, I know it sounds like I'm a David cheerleader, but it's just the truth. And what was happening at the time, he was by himself, period, period. Mm. You know, but so I can't say, I can't throw away the goodness of a person and, and a horrible car ride with a terrible argument. I can't do that. And, you know, everyone who's asking me to do that, you know, like go somewhere, go to hell with that. You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. I, I just won't do that. You know, I just have to remember, you know, when I was really, really going through it, who was there for me, you know what I'm saying? And who was really down and really showed up. And he did that. He really, truly, honestly did that. You know, I don't know who this person is now, but at that time, he was there for me. 
He was there for me, and that's all I can say about that. Was he there for you at the time more than your family was? Um. Well, my family and I were estranged at that time because, because of the show. Because of the show, and I would just, I just couldn't understand for the life of me, you know, why this was continuing. I'm telling you that this was destroying me, and this was continuing. Yeah, of course you wouldn't be upset about that, correct? So, I mean, it's like, what do you, you know what I mean? And, but I have to understand then too, it's their jobs. I get it. You know, everybody got to figure out how to pay their bills. But if we were getting paid the money that we were supposed to be getting paid and what we were owed and due, then probably that wouldn't have been the outcome. So you got to look at the entire picture. You know, you, you have to really understand that we have been the longest running family reality television, black reality television show in history and didn't get paid for it. We got paid pennies. And we were also the lowest paid reality stars. Help mm. me help make it sense. You know, it doesn't right. make sense. <laughs> so when you when you feel like you have to chase your check and you've done all of this work and you've had all of your success, you know, you have to look at the whole picture. You know, you, you can't just say, oh, oh, they, they didn't have my back. Well, their hands was tied too. You get what I mean? No, no, definitely. And especially when you look at the Braxtons in contrast to the Kardashians, right? And their deals, what their deals look like, how they're able to have final cut approval, which means they get to say what your images look like on television versus when you don't have that control, how they can bring their brands in and keep in control of all that money. We were not um, allowed. You, where you guys weren't allowed to do that? Wow. I remember putting out Love and War and having to pay for ad space. On the network? The show that I created. It was $50,000. Okay, so back to the phone call. When the 911 call was made and you heard the 911 call back, what were your thoughts? Because I, I always wanted to know what you thought about that call. Um... It was very difficult to hear, right? Because you have to understand this is somebody talking about you while looking at you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was really actually putting myself in his shoes and thinking about the dynamic of our relationship and where our relationship was at that time. Um, it was very strained and it was strained because of, of the show. It was a lot of it was about the show and um, how terrible I, I, I just felt terrible. I felt terrible because I felt like I ruined his life with this reality shenanigans and, and my toxic bullshit that came along with it. And it was nothing that I could do. I didn't even own myself. So I couldn't protect him. You know, I wanted to protect him. I couldn't protect him. And he was worried about his business. Um, he was worried about his life being um, changed, you know, in a negative way. And I knew that it was getting ready to change in a negative way. Um, but then here he is looking at his fiance on the floor of our home, who was basically almost dead, you know, and I can't judge anyone on how they respond to that. Only that person can explain that. And, you know, when I asked him what was going through your mind, you know, he was scared. He was scared and he blamed himself. And um, that's that. Mm -hmm. and, and in that so moment in a, with the man and they're here to protect you. And he, at that time, I felt like he did a good job at protecting me. You know, he felt like he was helpless. And mm -hmm. I felt like that tape exemplified and I sounded weird to everybody else and I got it and I get it <laughs> but you also have to know who that person is you know he's a talker and <laughs> sometimes he talks out loud and I just mm. that's what I heard mm. so recently you posted this on your Instagram story um it says for a long time I thought it was everyone else the problem was me hashtag standard construction mm -hmm. who who was who was that message for was it for everybody the network for your David, who? No, I haven't sent any subliminals to David at all. Um, because I just felt like 
the best thing that I can do right now is let him live his life and find happiness and be happy. And that's what I want for him. So no. Um, but what that did mean to me was um, I, I didn't realize that I was living such a toxic life. And even when what I was, what was, what was toxic about it though? My job was to toxic, which was at the top of the tier, which in turn, my family was because I worked with them <laughs> and the, not, the dynamic of our family was changed forever and different. And I wasn't close with my sisters anymore. I'm arguing and fighting over everything. Um, and that started off at work. I was arguing and fighting and unhappy with that. Then it trickled down to my family. Then it trickled down to my relationship. And then it trickled down to my friendships. Then it trickled down to even the relationship with my kid. Now, the relationship with me and my kid are, is different now, but the relationship then was very surfaced. And just like everything else, the, the relationship with my friends, I couldn't have or couldn't even keep my friends because I was just so toxic because I was so unhappy with my life. Um, I was unhappy with myself. I was sad every single day. And what kind of positivity can you have when you're sad like that and upset all the time, every single day. So um, when I thought that I was making strides and you know, being positive and trying to put positivity out there, it wouldn't last until I started to make the changes that is within. And um, I had to accept a lot of hard things about myself. You know, um, I wasn't happy with the woman that I had become. And I couldn't blame anyone else because I had, you know, to take responsibility for the, I, I, can't, I know I keep saying that, but it's just the truth. I had to really come to terms with the role that I played. And I showed up every day <laughs> for that role of being the most toxic woman in America. Yeah. Well, when I think about some of the stuff that I've seen just in the press about you with, uh, you know, because I'm I'm a survivor of um, sex abuse. I was molested. And I know that you went through a similar experience and it came out on national television. My understanding is it came out without your knowledge of it yes. coming out, which yes. is re-victimizing somebody over again. Um, and I know you're under construction, but do you still think it's, I mean, of course it's not okay that you were betrayed, but who is to blame for that? And do you forgive them? Cause I, when I feel victimized by my family till this day, they literally, I just cancel them, whether it's network, family, whoever, if you victimize me, you're out. Do you, are you at a place where you've worked on yourself to accept that that happened and you forgive them and move on? Or do, are you still hurt over that? Oh, um, it's hurtful. Now you have to think about it. And I keep saying it started off with my job because I know that no one wants to believe that. <laughs> but you have to understand when that happened to me, it doesn't matter who said it, who did it. I was at work. And those things are not supposed to happen when you're at work. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? And so it doesn't even matter to me who said it. It doesn't even matter to me that I feel like um, I was sold out for a good moment for, for viewerships, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? I, the responsible aspect of it to me is to have known that, you know, I've been living with this secret for a long time and I did nothing about it. I didn't do the work. Even when I was in my therapy sessions, I've never brought it up. I just pretended like it didn't happen. And that's where I just have to put on my big girl panties and say, you, you did nothing about it. I, I was just like everyone else. I, I ignored what happened to me. And when it was a safe place, when I was in a safe environment with, you know, as my therapist, I, I should have mentioned it. I should have said something. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I can't. Yeah. Um, say because it, I, I, I don't know that you should have said something. I, I think should have said those... something because if someone, if so, I have to prepare myself for you know my life, right? And so, had I talked to to a, to a counselor or my counselor therapist at the time about the things that was happening when that happened to me, I would have had the tools. Come on, <laughs> to work through that properly. 
And it wouldn't have, my life wouldn't have started to spiral out of control as it did since that day. Do you get what I'm saying? Because my life started to spiral out of control even more since that day. That was the mm -hmm. first time I contemplated suicide was that day mm -hmm. from my job. But at least, but at least everything that has happened has transpired in a way that has built it up for you to be able to work through it, right? You've been forced to deal with it now. Yeah. Um. The the fam. It was a family member, correct? Um. I would have to say because who, you know, Ayanna said, not, not, but you know, like somebody had to tell her, but she right. didn't have to say it either. So you know, tomato, tomato. Mm. <laughs> So speaking of Ayanla, now that you're under construction, is that relationship? That's your friend. I mean, I, I like Ayanla. I've not had the interaction with you that she so has. You that you have. Mentioned it? Doing her interview? Um, I, I have not asked her uh, because we, wait, wait. We I have not asked her because I'll be honest with you. I learned a lot more after the fact. My next interview, I'm absolutely asking that question for sure. Yeah. Um, And we haven't talked Just about it. Just permission to answer. So I don't want her to say, I can't answer that. I can't legally answer that. I'm not going to sue you. I'm not going to do anything. I just want to know, you know, because I felt raped all over again. You know, I had no choice. I had no protection. Um, I I had um, no regard for my feelings and just, you know, just coming out and saying that, okay, forget the fact that it didn't make prime time when the Braxons came on. It was still a hundred people in that house. You see what I'm saying? So in front of everyone, I felt dehumanized. I felt like a piece of meat. So she has my has she, answer. Has she apologized to you at all for that? No, she said I had mental issues because I reacted. So she said that? Rewind the tape. Take it back to her interview when she said that I yeah, I need mental health. So, but now, thank God for Jesus <laughs> and His worthiness to me. I have taken her advice. I'm getting help every single so day. So, would you? Do you think you can get to a place where you can have a conversation with Ian about it? I don't think that is necessary for me. You know, um, I'm not angry with her. I just don't understand why. It's almost like going to a therapist um, and you trust that person and in front of everyone, they divulge your innermost darkest secrets. Do you understand what I'm saying? How would you feel? You know, I don't think anger would be the right word. It is devastation. And then to be talked about so negatively afterwards, like you're not supposed to have a feeling about it. You know what I mean? As a therapist, you know these things. You know these things are wrong. It goes against every code, period, you know? Um, but like I said before, that, that's not my job. I can't funnel that out for her, you know? I can only um, work on myself and make sure that I have the tools to move forward to be the best Tamar possible. Listen, um, Jason, I am not going to let anyone stifle my growth any longer. I'm not going to let anybody hold me back from nothing that I've worked hard for. Um, and I'm definitely not going to hold myself back. And holding myself back would be holding on to each and everything that I felt victimized about. And I am a survivor, not a victim. I'm a winner. And what winners do, we win. We figure out how to win, and that's what we do. No, I love I love that. I love that. Um you're such a good person to talk to, by the way. <laughs> you are too, my friend. I love okay, you. Okay, wait. So when so have you found out which family member told your business and have you forgiven them? Nope, don't care. It's not my problem. Wow. Really? No, it's not my problem. It's not my job. It's not my Damn. job. Damn. That must be good therapy because um, I'm sorry. <laughs> you betray like the whole whoever was involved. No, I couldn't have done it. But Okay. Like, what are you going to do? Beat up the world? You're going to beat up your family? Like, what are you going to be mad I mean, every single day? And, and go I back? mean, there's nothing that's going to bring me to that dark place. And I'm not going to let no one bring me back to that dark place. So, what am I going to do? Relive that day every day and miss the rest of my life? No, I'm not going to do that. 
You have to right. pick your pieces and make the decision to move forward. Life is forward. Had something happened to me that day, guess what would have happened? Tomorrow. Right, right. But don't you, but but don't, but 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 did you give yourself the closure on it then? Because you, to get closure, you would have to say, for me, I'm closing that. It happened. I'm not going to deal, because you're still moving around people who somebody in that world betrayed you. Yeah, well, forgiveness is not for the other person. It's for That's yourself. That's true. That's true. You know, and you don't necessarily have to be in somebody's face like, you did that, 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 you did that, and that, that, you know, they did that to me. And that, no, no, that is living in that moment. You mm. have to move out of the moment to move towards your destiny. That's it. And that's and, and that's going to be a quote somewhere. Okay, <laughs> so Tony Braxton and Birdman are dating. You posted something on your Instagram recently that made all of us tea sipping, spilling people think that they got married on his birthday, um, but nobody else has confirmed it. Do you want to just tell us what the wedding was like and who was all there? So funny. Um, I didn't write that about a, a marriage or nuptials. I wrote that because uh, it was Valentine's Day and I'm single as a lark. <laughs> <laughs> And I was just congratulating them and to making it another year, honey. That's why I said congratulations, lovebirds. You know, they, mm -hmm. they figure it out some way, somehow, you know. Mm. You make me sick. <laughs> <laughs> I swear <laughs> that's what that's about. Hey, Mar, I'm telling you right now, in two months, if, if some kind of documentary shit comes out and I see Tony and Birdman on Valentine's Day married, I want everybody to come back to the show because... Me and Tamar are going to be under construction at that point. Well, you know, I'm not a liar. And so that's why I posted that. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I posted no. I promise. Okay. So let's talk about under construction because there are a lot of celebrities coming out with podcasts and I don't like any of them, but I do love yours. And I do feel like the reason why it's so good is because the conversations that you're happening are not all big celebrity driven. They're focused on the actual conversations. Um, and I like that because that's what people sign up for podcasts, you know what I mean? Um, and, and they want to hear people talk, but you have had, um, Taraji on there who I am in love with, who I've never met by the way. And I know that you did her show when you came up with the idea of under construction, how did you get there? Like, how did you come up with the name? What inspired it? Um, well, I came up with the name under construction because I am currently and will constantly be under construction. Um, you know, in taking responsibility for everything that has happened in my life and the role that I played in it um, was me being honest and open about the path that I will forever be on. And that is getting better and getting greater <laughs> at everything, at finances, at relationships, at relationships outside of um, um, personal, meaning like your work relationships, your friends, your, your man, um, um, and everything in between, parenting, um, everything that I am constantly working on, everything. Um, mm. So, you know, I'm, I just felt it necessary. And, you know, I've always wanted to be in radio and, you know, be in broadcasting and definitely, you know, have a talk show. Um, but I wasn't interested in just what everyone saw every single day. I wanted to invite people to be on this um life-changing experience and journey with me. And the only way that I could do that, it was to be honest about everything that has happened to me and not be afraid of it and face it head on and open the door for them to know that whatever has happened to you, it is okay. And you're not alone. And listen, I love the fact that it's all you. Yeah. It ain't you and David. It ain't you and Lonnie. It's you. <laughs> you need the Holy Ghost. No, I got, I got the Holy Ghost. I'm safe, sanctified, and filled with everything other than you having a co-host because we don't need nobody else. Oh. We want to hear what Tamar has to say. We want to see what Tamar thinks. We want to see who Tamar talking to. Um, and I don't know if there's a video component to it yet because right now we're all in different places. It's just yeah. audio, right? Yeah, but the reason that there's a method to that madness. The reason why I wanted to not have the video aspect was because I do know my background. And I do know my background has been toxic and problematic and untrustworthy. And I wanted all of my guests to know that this is a safe place. This is not that girl. This is not that scene. This is not that platform, nor will it ever be again. And so you own the show? 
Um, I partnered up with Stitcher. Um, so uh, we do it together and um, it's on every single platform, podcast platform that's out there. Mm. I love it. Well, um, so it sounds like you've been through a lot of therapy. You've done a lot of work. You're under construction, both on the podcast and real life. You clearly, you clearly feel differently about David than I do, which it's none of my business, but for my business, I don't like him. Would you, would you ever want to take him back? No. And I had to think about that and be honest with myself. And the reason why I said no is because I don't feel like um, we are the same people than we were. then. I know I'm a different Tamar and I don't know what it was about me that was attractive um, to him, but I don't know if the new Tamar would be attractive to him because I'm not her at all. <laughs> I don't even know that girl anymore. So. so tell me the difference. What's the difference? Is it because you've started really working through who that Tamar was or... Yeah, you know, I thought I was doing the damn thing. I thought I was the best woman in the world. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> mm. You know, I didn't know how to communicate. I was spoiled. I remember um, <laughs> my birthday making that hell for him. Like, what you going to get me? What am I getting? And what you going to do? <laughs> I'm not like that at all anymore. Like, this birthday, I'm looking forward, to, looking forward to being with my baby and his friends and having some cake and good night. <laughs> Just that mm. simple. I don't need all of those things anymore because I was filling my life with things to complete me. Well, when you look back over your relationship with Vince, do you blame that Tamar for that? Because, I mean, that Tamar was in it all. I mean, Lady Gaga's at the house. I'm, I'm sure y'all were jet. I mean, that life there was just full, right? Yeah. Then you had the show with your family and you had then the real, like you had all of that. Do you Do you look back and say that the old Tamar had a role in that falling apart or... Are you talking about the Vince thing in particular? Yeah, no, yeah. I don't. No, I do not. There was a lot that went on that I didn't know about. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so when you don't know about things, you can't do anything about the things you don't know about. And that's all I'm going to say about my baby daddy, because that is my baby daddy, you know? I love, I, so no, I feel you. You know, I wrote <laughs> in my book, I said, um, I said, I took all the darts that were thrown at me and I crafted them into a throne. Um, and, you know, and I, it sounds like you're in that stage and that process. Similar to, you know, who else reminds me of that was Mary J. Blige. Because when I met her in the 90s, she was so evil to me. But then I met her years later and I told her, like, girl, you are a mess. And she told me, like, I was broken back then. I had a lot going on, you know. And I just love when we can all have our breakthroughs and get to a point where we can look back over our life and see where we played a part in everything. So it sounds like you're in a much happier place. And I'm glad that you're still here because I ain't going to lie, kind of, I was like, wow, you know, because again, I know you outside of all of the Tamar Braxton stuff. And to see that it was, um, I, I'm just glad that you pulled through and that you're still here. Thank you, Pumpkin. I'm glad, you know, to have good people in my life, you know, and people that I trust and love like yourself. You know, you're an amazing human being. I remember the first time we talked was, was on an interview and I heard your, I didn't hear your voice. I heard your spirit. And I'm like, oh, this is a great person. <laughs> this is a great guy. And that still rings true today. And this is why your success has been where it is, because your spirit is so amazing and captivating. And, you know, no matter what people might say, oh, he's messy, this, that, and the other, your heart is pure. And I'll take that. You're, you're a good person. So I'm really grateful for God surrounding me with good people. And that's all you can wish for. Well, thank you. I received that. And um, I was going to say something else, but I just got to sit in that, you know, because... <laughs> True. You know, I do tend to say what I'm thinking, and sometimes you don't have to always say everything that you're thinking. Oh, uh, by, 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 the, <laughs> by the way, just to let y'all know, Tamar Braxton and I are both on Bego. Uh, she was in a room with Kiki Wyatt and Tiffany Haddish the other day, and the four of us were having a great conversation, and she literally dipped out without saying bye. It was totally against Bego standard. I did. Um, yes. We were I like, where the hell? No, you said I gotta go in a minute. The next thing, your box was empty. I said, you know what? But 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 Kiki did say, in all fairness, she said that's being a mom when you gotta put your kid to sleep. You gotta go because being a mom comes first. So true. All right. So you also have an event coming up, the Lucky Twenty One event. Tell me about that. Lucky Twenty One is a virtual conference, 
and it's only $99 and you have your favorite people on the panel. We even have a prayer breakfast and it's all about reclaiming your wins. This is everybody's winning season. Come and collect your wins. And it's all about everything that we talk about on Under Construction, my podcast, um, being better at finances, being the um, business person you've always wanted to be, being the relationship person you've always wanted to be, being better, being elevated, and come and celebrate your wins and come a lucky 20. Well, talking about celebrating your wins, my fans and your fans will kill me if I don't ask you about new music because that was another one of the yeah. number one questions. People are asking, where's the new music? Because I think your fans are called the Tamartians, right? Martians. <laughs> Tamartians are all down my Facebook asking about new music. So when are they going to get that? Um, I'm actually getting ready to go to the studio now. Late. That's why my phone was blowing up. Um, I don't know. You know, I had planned on um, releasing something much sooner, like right after um, Crazy Kind of Love came out, the True to the Game um, song that was on that movie. Um, but the pandemic happened. And I'm just one of those artists who really, really enjoys performing live. I don't want to Zoom my concerts. <laughs> I want to feel the energy of people. And I just thought that, you know, putting things out right now and, you know, you're not able to do anything. It's like, Beats the purpose because by the time you know the world opens up and concerts open up, what do you, you remember the records? They're not even right. no more. You know what I mean? And so, you know, the music that I've been working on is so personal and so amazing and so damn good that um, you know I, I decided to wait. Well, listen, everybody's waiting for it. So I appreciate you coming on the show, and um, I can't wait to see you again in these big old streets. If I don't see you in LA before then, I know uh, we have to get together for a lunch now that we're both almost vegans. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. We're gonna get together for the lunch and we're gonna unpack all of this interview there off the record. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> all right, bye Tamar. Bye baby, love you. Mwah. All right, look, that was a great show and make sure you keep coming back because we got all types of amazing interviews and topics that are gonna make you go crazy. Uh-huh, that's right. That means like, subscribe, do everything you need to do to make sure you stay up to date with what we got going on. And ladies, stay tuned in because you know I have your back. And listen, make sure that you're commenting below because even though I say I don't read it on the show, that's all I do when it's over. Peace.